Hello, good evening. Um, interesting to be the almost uh, final event in the Imagine Belfast Festival. Um, thank you very much for coming this evening. Um, I think it's particularly a, a, a thank you to those of you who kind of thought, oh, I'm not quite sure what this is. Um, there's plenty of people who kind of looked at it and went, Oh yeah, but oh, I'm busy. There's not something. It's yeah. It's is it something to do with I don't know religion? I don't know. We don't want to be. We're not interested in that. Um, but those of you, so thank you very much for coming. Um, to give you an idea about what this is about and how I'm going to do it, um, I have a little uh, presentation for you that I'm going to set up and run. And as I do it, I'm going to uh, read a little bit from my first book that I was working on called Belfast City of Light, uh, looking and listening to Belfast come with me. I know that some of you have, uh, I recognize some of the names here. Some of you are very much aware of the, the work that I do and, um, and have read the book and I'm aware that some of you haven't. Um, so I just kind of want to get us in the zone first before I actually look at doing some questions and answers. And what I've got, what the presentation is, is basically what I, what I did over a period of 10 years um, as a, an artistic thread, really, as a non-church goer, is I started to go to every church in Belfast for a service. And um, as I went along that process, um, all sorts of interesting things happened to me and um, what I've recently been doing is I have been editing photographs from it. Um, I felt very much with doing the, the written book I needed to get the written stuff out of my head first and I couldn't do the photographs and the written part at the same time so I did that first and then um, I've been working on working my way through the um, the visuals of that. So the first part of that I've done is this like little newspaper, um, which I've called Belfast City of Light, looking and listening to Belfast Come With Me, spring edition. A few people have been saying, when can they get this? When are they, when are they going to get the summer and autumn? I don't think I'm going to do that, but um, I'm aware of some of you have that as well. Uh, but if anybody hasn't and is still interested in getting that. Um, sorry, I am getting messages that people are trying to get on and they can't tell me. So this is the this is the book, um, her original book. And I just want to start off a little bit on the preface. I didn't set out to go on this journey or write this book, but simply started to follow an artistic thread like many artists over the centuries before me. The thread became so compelling and extraordinary that I eventually de felt destined to write it down. What if instead of listening to the continuous repeated stories of Protestant versus Catholic in Belfast, an individual had first-hand experience of visiting every church in the city for a service, simply looking and listening? when going to each one. What would they see and hear? As a non-church goer starting out on this journey, how would you feel 10 years later? What is going on in the churches in contemporary Belfast? And how might this open-minded curiosity inform the continuous shifting conversation about the city that I call home? Introduction. It seems that if you take any snapshot of time in Ireland, Northern Ireland and the United Kingdom's history, it acts as a continual unfolding narrative of complexity. For hundreds of years, the geopolitics of the islands has troubled many and incited violence in others. The fight or flight mechanisms have been bred into us natives because of real first-hand experience of violence or the threat of it. It can take time to switch off from these violent impulses. In the 60s, troubles traditionally reported as a conflict between Protestants and Catholics in which over 3,600 people died. 
broke out in Northern Ireland and for 30 years bombs and bullets were an everyday occurrence in the streets of Belfast and beyond. The peace process since has been an elaborate dance of two steps forward and one step back, with innumerable complicated accounts evolving all the time with the Good Friday Agreement at the core. We're only a little region of the world measuring just under 14,000 square kilometres, with a population of around 1.8 million, but is still learning to govern itself with much distrust and not much leeway. Yet somehow, Relative peace has come to our shores, and we would like to keep it that way. The chronic nature of violence in the past and the close proximity of victims and perpetrators has meant that peace has been difficult to keep on track, but still many try, while others try to flip it back into violence. To me, however, there's always been a feeling that we must try harder to move towards true peace. I'm heartened that the European visitors staying with me for a short while in Belfast have never heard of the IRA, the Irish Republican Army, or the UVF, the Ulster Volunteer Force, or any of the breakaway groups, and that the daily happenings of violence have mostly become a bad memory, that are for some more vivid than others. We are left with Belfast, the capital of Northern Ireland, or the North of Ireland, being known as the trauma capital of the world. So where do we go from here? And is there something we've missed? Chapter one, in the beginning. Would anybody like to go to church? Asked my friend Martha. We were in Dublin and had just woken up after a fancy dress party for a friend's 40th. Many of the revellers stayed overnight and surfaced for breakfast and were nursing hangovers. Yeah, I'll go, was my response. I thought the walk would do me good before driving back to Belfast. It was a Catholic church, quick service, rhythmic mumbling prayers and automated responses. The congregation knew the drill and enjoyed the haste. The surprise for me was a feeling that I'd previously been having amplified a hundredfold within this church during the service. Great flows of something, energy maybe, would be the best way to describe it, trickled down my head. On exiting the church, I turned to Martha and told her what had happened. She said, maybe we're converting you. <laughs> no, I don't think so, but something's up, I replied. Religion and I didn't really get on. In my first year at grammar school, my school report showed my religion mark to be 19% and my class position to be 88 out of 90. The teacher's comment was uninterested. And quite honestly, that is how I stayed for the next 35 years. Before undertaking this journey, I would have described myself as spiritual but removed by choice from the mainstream religions in Northern Ireland. In my teenage years, I built up a barrier between myself and religion, a result of what I saw on a daily basis during the Troubles, people being blown up, murdered, and all nature of horrific incidents. Something to do with God, apparently. If it hadn't been for my paternal grandmother, Ganger, or Anna Lawson, who had a very strong faith, I don't think I'd even have been christened or confirmed. Having been born in the 60s and brought up in rural Northern Ireland, the troubles and endless Protestant versus Catholic violence and rivalry just switched me off to any true connection to any church. I blocked out what was going on to survive, tried to be normal, a normal teenager, and planned my escape to England and art college. Later years, in later years, I was disgusted by what had happened in Northern Ireland in the name of religion. And as every church scandal broke out in my, the media, I reveled in its reporting because it seemed to confirm my and no doubt others' thoughts that organised religion was best avoided. That it was more about abuse and subjugation than love. The height of my church attendance was carol services, weddings, christenings, funerals, or European Heritage Open Days, 
where I would simply enjoy the quietness of the space. Nothing, I thought, would get me to engage any differently. Put off by my early experiences and not being one for scripture union, well, they all seemed a little bit smug and suspiciously happy. I grew up with a constant reminder of the connection between religion and violence and hid in the art room, dreaming of another life. Living in the country has felt as if the action was happening down the road and over the hill far enough away and many people just tried to get on with their lives as best they could. I attended a school with 98% of the pupils from one religion but had a wide selection of village friends from the other side. Always mixing, I was never one of those Northern Irish people who didn't know somebody from another religion until they went to third level education, if they were lucky enough to get there. Escaping to art college in England in the 80s, I thought I'd never live in Northern Ireland full time ever again. But after years in Bristol, Winchester, London, then New York on a Fulbright scholarship, I found myself back in Northern Ireland pre-ceasefire. Somebody recently asked me why I came back. After all, it was still pretty dangerous. But it's hard to describe just how normal it was to exist with some level of violence. It was the elephant in the room, a constant presence and topic of conversation that many people were expert in living around. The ceasefire happened when I, well, I and 25 other Northern Irish 28-year-olds were on the Wider Horizons programme funded by the International Fund for Ireland and Thunder Bay, Canada. The initiative was through Townsend Enterprise Park in Belfast and Dundalk Unemployed Resource Centre over the border and it was aimed at young people who were looking to set up their own business. We couldn't quite believe the news but felt optimistic and energised about the future on our return, which all the northern participants decided to do make a go of it at home. It wasn't easy. Many people just told me to leave. But although I knew people lived differently elsewhere, as I'd experienced it myself, I really wanted to be back in Northern Ireland. It was home after all. Many of the group met on a Friday to give each other peer support and encouragement. We called it that was the week that was and we'd share the highs and lows of previous five days, vital sustenance at a difficult time. I remember George Briggs, one of the mentors on the programme, say, I remember saying to George Briggs, one of the mentors on the programme, that I'd like his job, taking me seriously. He took me under his wing, and when we returned from Canada, I set about becoming a trainer, become mentor, become business advisor, and in the following 13 years, I spent my time designing and running cross-border, cross-community development programmes, mostly within the enterprise network, moving people into voluntary, full or part-time education or self-employment. I wanted to contribute to the much-needed mental shift and peace-building work that happened, and I found I had a knack for it. People would say to me, oh, you don't do anything creative anymore. And I'd reply, have you any idea how creative you have to be standing in a tree, standing in a training room on the peace line, trying to get people to focus on their cash flows while there's a paramilitary funeral going on outside? I love the people, but found great difficulty with the system of support, not understanding at the time that it was traumatised. The end of my work in North Belfast, which at the time had the most, five most deprived wards in Europe, came when I walked into work one day and collapsed, no more able to process what I later understood to be the trauma of the people I was dealing with on a daily basis and the aggressive, violent spirit of the place. After some time off, I returned to work and handed in my notice, unwilling to put my body through the continuous stress of working in such an environment anymore. My boss, Michael McCrory, died of lung cancer a year later, brought on no doubt by the stress of developing a business centre from the ground up in the contentious interface area. Some everyday questions he had to answer were, can we build a 12th of July bonfire in your car park? What shall we do with the pipe bomb? The pipe bomb I find in the shrubbery. 
and the classic how are we going to get the tiles back on the roof the ones we the ones we saw on the news being pulled off and thrown in the middle of the road during rioting in north belfast i marveled at what was happening there in order to try and keep it safe but at the same time i noticed how disconnected belfast was with people living in those safe areas seemingly wanting to hold on to their positions of privilege and look down their noses at the parts of Belfast that had been deeply immersed in conflict. In the past, granted this was for safety reasons, but was that still relevant? Some people would ask me why I would take on such role, but somebody had to do it. Three years after leaving North City, I started to feel like I was getting back to my old self. I worked freelance and men with mentoring, and found the pull towards spending time connecting with a creator and maker self totally overwhelming. The essential nature of me, what I'd pursued as a girl, like other artists before me, obsessed for hours over the deep meditative nature of the creative process. But my connection had been clogged by vicarious trauma. Definition of this is a transformation in the self of a trauma worker or helper that results from empathetic engagement with traumatized clients and the reports of traumatic experiences. It's a special form of counter transference stimulated by exposure to the client's traumatic material. Its hallmark is disrupted spirituality or disruption of the trauma worker's perceived meaning and hope. The term was coined specifically with references to the experiences of psychotherapists working with trauma survivor clients. It gives you an idea of what I and others were dealing with on a daily basis and aids understanding of what happened to me. My creativity was belittled by a society, desperately trying to be post-conflict, but getting back to creating my own work artwork intensively after using my creativity for other things is was a sublime experience. I was being called to stop what I was doing and make some space for making and creating. And once I started, I couldn't stop. Stop and create are two of the most powerful words that I know. just um I would stop that there I can start to see people now isn't this lovely I can see all the humans who are watching me I recognize some people I see I see Chicago I see Dublin I see my spare room I see Kathy down the Ards Peninsula I see I see Haley in in Brighton <laughs> Francesca, Burley went, wow, so I, I, this is so lovely. So I, I, I know some people here and I don't, I, there's other people I don't know. Um, what I hoped to do really was to, I mean, that was just a, a little introduction to get us in the zone a little bit. What I was hoping to do was to, answer some questions. I was hoping people might have some questions for me um, about this experience and I was hoping then to uh, answer some questions. So what sorry I've just got a message here show photos. Did you not see the photographs? Oh, after all that, so sorry. As I was reading that, they were all there. Okay, perhaps. Okay. As I was reading that,
can anybody let me know if if they're they're actually seeing these now? Tommy, can you let me know? Yeah. Great. So maybe as these these are going along or going through, if people have any questions in the chat, um, I do have a couple that have been sent in to me. Okay, and I will. Okay. Okay. You've, from Francesca, you visited so many churches. What were your main discoveries? And how did you feel about your experiences? Did you think about stereotypes or were they true? Um, I'm not sure, Francesca, if you've read the book or not. <laughs> Because you'll see that there's a lot of things um, that come up with that. Um, I suppose my initial stereotype was I thought is I didn't think that anybody went to church anymore. Um, I nobody that I there's maybe two people in my kind of circle of people that I knew that um, were still churchgoers. Um, I kind of assumed that nobody, um, I assumed that nobody, um, that nobody else went to church. And um, as a result of that, I was really surprised actually when I started to go to church and I saw so many people were actually going to church. Um, so that was one kind of stereotype that I'd thought. Um, I think there were so there were so many things. There were so many things, and there were so many experiences of, of that. Um, you have to read the main book for it. But the main thing, one thing was, I thought that nobody went to church. Um, and then it took me a while to decide. I mean, I didn't decide this. It, I was really reluctant for the first few years of doing it. Um, I was really, really reluctant. And it was such a point where like people, I would tell people what I was doing and I would just burst out laughing because it just seemed so totally, it just seemed such like a mental thing to do. Um, but I realized that it, it, it soon became, it was really interesting then to uh, once, well, Francesca, you live you live in Northern Ireland, and that you know that everybody. We have a big thing about you know what's your name, where do you come from, what school you went to. You know, we're always it's it's changed more maybe over the last even ten years, but it's really there's all of that baggage that we have of placing and putting people in boxes and stuff. And I know from all of the cross community work that I did and all the cross border work, everything that, you know, there's, we've got so, we've got so much baggage and, but I find that this is the one thing that I have done that nobody can go, oh, you're just this or your name's this, so I'm not listening to you or, you know, whatever it happens to be, they kind of doesn't matter how it doesn't matter how strong they are in a particular viewpoint. Um, they will actually stop and sometimes they just stop and laugh. Um, but they do stop and often then they will ask you questions, um, which I find really, really interesting. And initially, initially, uh, and then once they realise that you are serious and that you have really done this, the questions become really interesting. Um, the questions become really interesting and it, yeah, just becomes really interesting. Um, OK. 
Okay. How did I feel about my experiences? Um, uh, how did I feel about my experiences? I was <laughs> very reluctant, a little bit annoyed, um, confused, surprised, uh, and then eventually, after about, eventually after about four years, I kind of thought, oh, there's there's something else going on here, and. Um, and yeah, I don't, I don't, yeah, I don't feel like I'm the, the same person that I was at the beginning of it, if that makes sense. I'm not the same person. And my stereotypes, um, yeah, I assumed nobody went to church, but I find a whole other ball game of what was actually really going on. Okay, Vicky. Vicky Cossack. Um, Vicky Cossack. So I said, I love the work that you're doing, that you've done, and as you know, and I wonder what's happened to your thinking and the project since it was published. Well, um, very interestingly, I, I published it just before uh, lockdown happened. Uh, my last, I did three talks. My last talk was like the week before everything just closed down. So I was kind of starting to gear up for things and then everything was closing down. So it felt, it, it kind of felt a bit, it was a bit frustrating. Um, but it seemed that there were bigger things, you know, out there that were more important. And that was just the way it was. What's happened in my thinking? Well, I think what, what's kind of really interesting now is that every, everybody's slowed down because of COVID. And um, everybody has slowed down. And so some people maybe are, you know, there's a lot of questioning that's going on with what's happening in the world. Um, people have slowed down. And in many ways, they're, they're may, people have more space maybe to think about what I've written about or yeah people have um, maybe more space in order to think about that and um, and it's been quite interesting doing the paper the newspaper part because I was having difficulties you know it's so massive I was having difficulties then looking at how do you edit that down into a visual kind of book and um, but doing the newspaper has been really useful is actually just getting me through that kind of log jam of all of the images and all of all of the images and kind of looking at a process of that and I'm really excited I really I have been um, working away on developing a, a kind of larger photo book and I've been really it's been really exciting actually doing that and I wonder it, yeah because it was it took me about three years to finish the written one with all the feedback and everything that I was getting so I wondered maybe I should have started with the pho photograph one first I don't know that was just my artistic process um What has happened to your in the project since it was published? Um, well, I think it's really interesting as well what's happening at the moment or what was happening as it's coming down to. I'm just going to stop that. Coming down to um, when COVID happened and what's going on in the churches, that you were. You know, there's been a massive reorganisation and how congregations are meeting people and what's going on. There's been a whole big, massive transformation of connecting with people online. So I've, I've kind of been documenting that as well, which I, I think is really interesting. Um, if that answers that question. Thank you. 
what are your some of your Ian Reynolds? What are some of your favourite buildings, church buildings in Belfast? Thinking architecturally, I like I like the ones that surprise you when you go in, and you think, wow! If you looked at the book, that's really something from the outside. You think there's like they're like bunkers, and there's they're all you know, grills on them and, you know, it just look you drive past them and we don't see them anymore. We just think, oh, maybe there's nobody using that and that's just, you know, disused. And then you go inside and it's like really beautifully looked after and there's fabulous stained glass and, you know, embroideries and um, needlepoint and, you know, just really, really magical kind of things inside. Um, there's a there's an and every every time I think I've seen everything architecturally, I go in another one and it's like wow, you would never think this. There's one up in Glen Bryn, a very contemporary one, that just looks like a from the outside, it just looks like a big square box, but when you go inside, there is an amazing luminosity at the top, and whoever designed it, and I haven't found out, but whoever designed it, there's like a a square box on the top where the light just hits it and it just lights up the whole building and you're in it it's right in the middle of a housing estate and when you're in it and there's a service going on and if it's sunny whoo you just get this the light just totally fills the whole building it's really magical um i love the really old gospel halls i think I'd never, ever, ever been. There are loads of gospel halls in Belfast. I had never been inside one. Never. Just kind of saw them from the outside and thinking, I'm not sure what's going on in there, but I am never going to go in. And they have been a real revelation. They're really, um, you know, there might be like five people in them, but they're immaculate they have been looking after them for generations and they you know they're really stripped back in how they do and some of them are really 1930s or 1950s really really interesting kind of interiors really magical um yeah and then there, there's some uh, interesting ones very kind of 60s and 70s ones there was there was a massive church build stuff that was going on in Belfast so there's some really interesting um contemporary ones like say with the Elam churches um yeah and some odd just yeah it's just the oddness of it all it's the oddness of it all and you think I was talking to somebody a, a, an artist last week who was getting their head around what I've done and she said and she she was from the south I don't know if she's on here today but she said it just like really blows my mind to think that there's all those churches up there with no um decoration in them or thinking that you know Catholic Church is a very different interior than um some of the Presbyterian churches or, you know, the gospel halls and the different things. So all the iconography and all things like that I find really interesting. What, and what, what the images are that have been burnt into our heads. If you are from Northern Ireland, if you're kind of my age, we all were brought up in a tradition of some shape or form. And so we have these images that are kind of burnt in our head to do with to do with religion and spirituality and then and then that's I think that's kind of like pressed into our heads during um if you were brought up during the troubles you know there's a there's an extra pressing that goes into your brain around all of this stuff and then to kind of come out of that and then really to find a way of actually viewing that differently when you're older I think it's really it's really interesting Hope that answers that. Um, Kathy, you're saying, what kind of questions did people ask? Um, is it true what they say about Presbyterians? <laughs> 
So I have to say on that, first of all, okay, well, what have you been told about Presbyterians? Um, because it's like, you know, there's a thing about, there's a thing I write about in the book about um, we, you know, people taking back points of view from maybe their grandparents. Oh yeah, my granny always said, there was one that says my granny always said Presbyterians are very doer people. Um, you know, and the grandmother is like 90. So the, it's, that's taking the point of view of what was going on in the grandmother's life at that time. But the contemporary person who's kind of my age, never actually having the experience of seeing for themselves what the case is um, and finding, you know, there's there's amazing Presbyterian churches in Belfast. Um, there's some, there's really kind of, there's a lot of really amazing work that's going on within the Presbyterian church. What else that people ask me? Um, is, is it true that um, Catholics don't sing? Is it true that Catholics don't sing? And I write about that in the in the book because um, <laughs> often uh, in the in the Catholic churches in Belfast, yeah, you'll have a choir or you'll have one person who might sing, um, but everybody, the, you know, the congregation doesn't sing. Everybody who's there doesn't sing, and. Yeah, I, I kind of go down a wormhole. Hello, Jane. I can see Jane Morris. So I go down a wormhole about that, trying to find out why that might be. Um, I'll answer some kind of part on that. Okay. What was the significance of saying that you were an artist following an artistic thread? Um, I think that, you know, there's a reason why artists exist. There's a reason why artists exist. And sometimes when I say I'm an artist, people will say, oh no, but what do you really do? Or they'll go, oh, I can tell you, I can say you're something else. Tell me, who do you work for? I can I can write you down as something else. And I go, no, I am an artist. People immediately underestimate you. Um, but you know, artists follow bizarre threads. Artists follow threads of investigation that nobody else will go anywhere near. And it also, um, if you've read what it is that I'm doing, you, there's a point whereby to start off, the way I could, I kind of tricked myself on this journey was kind of going, I'm just following an artistic thread. You know, I'm just finding this out. As an artist, this, there's something interesting going on here. And I, this is what I'm investigating on. I, this is what I'm investigating. So there's, there's things that artists do that other people think that are totally crazy. But that's kind of okay because that's part of, that's part of our role, really. That's part of our role. Um, any other questions here? How did you feel about gravitating towards the community, the environment, and the silence, and the intergenerational, and yeah. Yeah, I mean, the, we are so harassed well it's kind of changing now because everybody's a lot of people are working from home and stuff and everything but people's daily life or can be really really noisy really harassing you know people have if they're in home they have a lot of different um pulls on their time and energy and actually just to get away and to sit somewhere quiet if it is quiet on things, Haley, is just lovely. And that feeling of, oh, this is just a quiet space, a feeling of actually space. And um, 
and yeah, inter inter intergenerational community. Yeah, I really noticed that because I mean I don't have any children, but what I noticed was because I was going out and I was going out to different places. It was actually just nice to see other people's kids in church at different stages of their lives, and you really notice then. You know the church community. How the church community are actually, you know, to get you know, a, a, you know, it's difficult. Bringing up children is difficult, but actually having a wider kind of church community to help with that—that that was really nice. And yeah, and I love all the elderly ladies and men, and you know, all of the, you know, that that yeah, that feeling of community. And it was like no matter where you went in the city. Uh, Wherever it was, it might be 10 people, it might be 2,000, well, 1,000 people. And here they are, no matter, you know, trying to hold on to something there within that and, and building something nice in with that. Um, oh, we've got an architecturally St. George's, High Street, Rosemary Street non-subscribing, which is lovely. St Malachy's in the markets, the Shamrock Church in the Shangle. Yes, there's a beautiful Shamrock Church on the in the Shangle, um, with a, a a woman minister. It is very beautiful. St Mary's and Holy Cross on the Crumlin Road. Yeah, I encourage people to. I would say St Mary's in the centre of Belfast is, well. I know a lot of the churches are opening tomorrow because of COVID and they've been closed, but St. Mary's, I would say, is the most used church in the whole of the city and on a continuous basis. If you just go and sit in it and watch people come in and out, that it, it, you can see the, the connection and what, what, yeah, you can see the connection and what the, the importance of the, of the religion for, for some people. Okay, Ruth, can you say more about why you took the images? When did you take them? After the service, did you ask permission? What did you feel most compelled to photograph? Um, why did I? Well, I started, I started doing this and then went, well, oh, how am I going to document this? So actually what would happen is after I go for a service, I would write it up. I have a book and I would kind of write up and I would collect anything from it that they gave you and um and i started doing me drawings and stuff it didn't seem right and I, I i do take i i'm not a photographer but i do sometimes use photographs in my work and i thought well that's the way to do it i would always ask permission um and i would always do it after the service so sometimes it's quite quick you have to be quite quick to get things because everybody's reorganizing stuff so there's that feeling of right you're just going out of the church in some of them um so i would always ask permission there was only there was two churches that said no and i kind of respected that and um there and i would try i wouldn't uh, photograph people although sometimes you would get um there's an odd time that I would have people, or sometimes there was, there were a couple of ladies going, please photograph us. <laughs> I do have a photograph of them and say, nobody asked for our photograph anymore, please photograph us. So I kind of got them. And um, what did you feel most compelled to photograph? It changed. Um, I have thousands of photographs. I was just, it's like for some I, I, you know, I look for patterns and rhythms and stuff. And um, for some of it's like, I notice I've got a lot of stuff about chairs and I've got a lot of stuff about books. Um, I've got a lot of stuff that's all textures. Um, so it, there's like different threads of things. Uh, and I, I have been you know, going through editing everything, trying to look for patterns and rhythms and things of how I'm actually going to develop it all. Um, I hope that answers your question on that. Okay, Sue Ellen, can we unmute Sue Ellen? Tommy, are you there? Sue Ellen, you can speak. <laughs> Ask your question. 
Uh, thank you, Bruna. That was so wonderful. And I'm so glad that it, um, a lot of people showed up for this presentation. So um, I, I, I speak from a particular lens and from going to Belfast and working with you over years. Um, and in, I'm speaking from Chicago. Um, certainly we have our own take on violence and certainly racism and hypermasculinity. But uh, so my question is, um, I see this, your work, this piece of your work is this really deep investigation, this deep research, this finding out for yourself as, a, as an artist, as a woman. Uh, as a peace worker, as a former organizer, as somebody who has recovered from trauma and continues to re recover from trauma, as a citizen, as a lover of Belfast. So there's, I think, 31 people here today. Yeah, I see 31 people here today. How has your work been received so far kind of in this historic backdrop of hyper-masculinity? And, and I know Belfast is changing and the younger generation is thinking differently about the world, but how's how's it been received? Uh, mostly, it's just ignored. <laughs> what I find really, really interesting is the total lack of interest in doing something so totally mental as this, because every. All of most of the media is traumatized, yeah. and yeah. so it. I don't fit in anybody's box, mm -hmm. so therefore they don't know what to do with me. Mm -hmm. So it's it's mostly mostly been ignored, but which I find really really interesting. Because they can't, everything, everybody's got their point of trauma in the media and in the city and in whatever. And if you're coming along and going, I've done this and look what happened. They're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I'm sorry. I really want to talk about the UDA, um, you know, and or, oh, no, no, no. It's like the dissidents. That's what we're, you know, oh, no, 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 no. They're in that, you would call it the reified trauma story. That's, it's the, the reified warrior trauma story. So if you're coming along going, actually, I've done this and maybe there's something else going on here. It's like, kind of like that. Can, hold that thought. I see Jane Morris just below you. Tommy. Can you unmute Jane? I see your hand there. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Rona, and and it's 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 great what you're doing and what you're trying to do. And yeah, just what you said there now resonated so much with me. And I and I have to head on very quickly. That's why I can't. I wanted to get in now, but um, I'm noticing something like graffiti. You know, every time a news report comes on, they show the graffiti of someone written no Irish border or something like that. Yeah. And I'm thinking, is it, is, do we need to do this art on walls <laughs> and get, and get it uh, into, to get it into the news? And is there any way that that could be? I know there's a great graffiti going around, um, uh, uh, keep, love, uh, love not hate or something. And they're, yeah. and they're stenciling it on, on things. Yeah, but she love but, not hate. Yeah. yeah, I mean, is it is it something? Is there is there another way of publicizing what but this sort of work that will grab attention? I have I, I so I I'm following a thread with that as well. So I am I am trying to use the resources that I have, um, and the you know I'm following a thread with that as well. So. Yeah, if you come up with anything. <laughs> well, can you get a good wall? <laughs> I know. I've got a thing about art on walls, I have to say. It's my least, it's my least, um, it's my least favourite way of doing art. Okay. Mm -hmm. but, um, yeah, so it's, I think, it, we're, yeah, it's about starting the conversation. 
on that. Yep. Yep. That, Thank you. Starting the conversation. I'm aware that time is 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 kind of is moving on. Um. Big two two two. I like that one. I heard that Belfast punks went to Paisley's church services for the free food afterwards. Probably. <laughs> I have to say, I did go to Paisley's church when he was still alive. He was still alive when I went, and there weren't too, there there weren't an awful lot of people there. I have to say, I would say there were maybe thirty people in the church, and um, I. I went I went up and I told him what I was doing afterwards. He was standing outside and I shook his hands and I told him what I was doing and he just started he just kept shaking my hand and laughing. <laughs> I thought, oh that's that's quite interesting. But again, that was kind of interesting for me because he was always, you know, growing up, he was always this big figure saying no a lot. And and as a small girl and a large man shouting no and um, the Pope's an to Christ or whatever it happened to be, to then come in as a middle-aged woman to a man at the end, more at the end of his life and listening to him and then telling him what I'm doing and kind of shaking his hand and him laughing. There was like some kind of weird cycle that was going on there for me. I kind of think of, all right, you're not that scary. <laughs> something like that um, so yeah so I don't know I, I do know there was say quite interesting I have you know, I, I've met all sorts of really interesting clergy and priests and stuff and everything doing this and um, I do know of a, a priest that went to um, Paisley's church and he said to me afterwards he says he says, the thing is, they were saying something about the Catholic Church that isn't true. <laughs> so if so, it's like maybe they need, if, if, if they're going to say something about somebody else's religion, maybe they need a specialist of that religion there to kind of go, actually, no, you're wrong. The Catholic Church doesn't actually say that, but I think that's, I think that's quite interesting. <laughs> Is it true Rhonda Paisley played a role? I'm, I'm not sure which one in particular. Oh, who did the best sermon on sex, please? I did say about that. David Campton, the Reverend David Campton, who is in, um, uh, who is a Methodist. He's on the Agape Centre on the Lisburn Road. He is the only minister who mentioned sex in the entire 10 years of going around the churches. It's going on to 12. He did the most amazing sermon on, on sex. He had everybody absolutely roaring in the aisles. But he had everything, LGBT, everything, 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 everything. And... There were there are a number of um, retired ministers that go to his church, and as as they were going out, they were saying, "Do you know what? In all the years that I was a minister, I never did a, I never did a sermon on sex, and um, but it's actually one that everybody should hear. It was brilliant, totally brilliant, totally, totally brilliant, absolutely hysterical." So I'm aware, I'm aware, I keep thinking that they're just going to press the button and everything's going to stop. Um, oh, hold on, I've got one more message. The LGBTQ yeah, community, welcome in a church. Yes, this was something that in my mind I thought, oh, you know, no, but, you know, the church doesn't want the LGBTQ community. But I find... Lots of really interesting things going on there. Um, I find um, some really interesting services uh, around transphobia. Um, there, there's a church that has a lot of 
there's a, a couple of churches that have a lot of the trans community that go to them, which I think is great. There's, um, I don't, like when I was in Chicago with Sue Ellen, I'd see, you know, there's much more uh, like the rainbows outside churches and there's a lot, lot more stuff like that going on. But certainly there are, um, there are a lot of churches that are very welcoming. Um, I'd say Karen, Reverend Karen Samutheran, I can never pronounce her second name, has set up um, a kind of outreach particularly with the LGBTQ community. She's really interesting. She is the first Baptist female minister, first female Baptist minister in Ireland. And she is, um, she is registered with the GB Baptists, but not the Irish Baptists, because they don't want, not the Baptists of Ireland, because they don't want women ministers, but she is with the GB Baptists, which shows you how all of this administration of everything kind of goes like who decides when what is actually going on you, there's every you know as you know there's every little um variance on various different things um but she's really interesting what she's doing she's particularly looking at she particularly likes to connect with people who don't think they belong in church which i think a lot of people that's a lot of people that is that, that is the case on that one minute I'm coming to so I suppose any other <laughs> anything quickly you can get me on I suppose um, it's yeah it's kind of just putting this on people's horizon on things I am desperately trying to finish off the photo book um, if anybody I know some of you on here have received this in the post free and, so, and I, I've just been, um, I've been sending out to people, some people that addresses and stuff that I know. But if you, I, you haven't received it and you would like it, just contact, just contact me. I am on all platforms of things, or you can put your um, message in the uh, chat there. Um, and really, it's just, if you think of there's, if you usually think that there's anything. Anything, anything that I should be connecting with or that I'm not already doing, please let me know. Please connect with me. Or if you just think I'm mad, that's okay. Please let me know that as well. <laughs> I see a few people smiling at that. <laughs> but um, Mimi, it's really nice to see you. I know that I have been sending you you sending you messages on things, so it's really nice to see you in person on that. Any, any, anybody's got something burning before they 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 press the button. Anybody got something? Per Love the way you still say it's mental. It is mental. It is. <laughs> it is mental. It is. And that's what's, you know, that's what's so interesting that there's so many, there's so many people caught in the, the trauma part of it that to get your head around this is just, is just too much for some people. But the, um, the um, yeah, it is mental. But in an interesting way, I think, as artists do interesting things, Hayley. <laughs> Don't they? I, everybody who's here that I can see now, I want you all in one room. I want you all in one room to feed you. Which be nice. Hello, Jackie. I see you there at the bottom on that. And I know there's some people here that I haven't, I don't know. No, I just see Patrick. Any last questions before I have to wrap up, see if I've missed anything? Oh, one new question. 
Love to all. Keep the faith. Sue Ellen. Did anybody ask if you were saved? Yes. Yes, a few people did. And if you read the book, there's like a thing about that. That's something, you know, that's something that would just like make me run a mile <laughs> growing up. As I'm growing up, there's a lot of people who just come up to you and go, have you been saved? And you're just like, oh, just get me out of here. Just <laughs> get me out of here. Um, but um, yeah, I found a way of of actually standing, standing. And while somebody's saying that, even if they say like three or four times, sometimes that would happen and be able to actually reiterate and um, very positively kind of with them and they kind of appreciated that which I thought was quite interesting. How long in the services? <clears throat> There's one. How long the services are on average and what's the longest one you attended and the shortest? The shortest one was 15 minutes. For the half eight service up in West Belfast, um, I can't remember the name of the church, 15 minutes, including communion. I think that must have been a record. The longest one, t about two and a half hours. And that is the um, Orthodox Church. But I, because I, I read it kind of wrong, what they do is they will sing. A number of people will sing for maybe an hour. To, what they like to do is like develop the energy in the space before the actual service goes. But if you actually include that in the whole thing, it's about two and a half hours, <laughs> which is quite a long time. Hello. Hypermasculinity, yes, there's a lot of that about. I think I've answered all your questions. There must be some more. There must be some more. Anybody who's unmuted, who's not, who is Declan O'Leary, come on, have you got a question for me? Declan? No. Tommy, can you unmute Declan? Tommy, are you still there? Sorry, Declan, I can't hear you. Tommy, are you there? Sorry, I've got... No, I, I don't think he's... I can't hear him. Sorry, Declan, I can't unmute you there. If you want to type, if you want to type it in the message, that would be grand. Okay, okay. This is interesting. I'm not being cut off. I'm not being cut off. Yeah, Declan, if you're if you're going to ask me something for some reason, I can't on you in this. You need to just put it in the chat. How are you going forward with this? There's a question from Haley. I am, um, well, I'm working on doing a kind of more, uh, a kind of bigger photo book. It's kind of how to edit these images out of my head. And, you know, each time I do something, the conversation moves on a little bit further. And I, I'll just keep doing that. But if there's, if there's something or there's things that people think that would be, um, that I should be doing, or that I'm interested in, I just really, I just really, yeah, I just want to answer people's questions. I feel like there's so, I've, there's so much, um, I have so much knowledge and perspective on it. I just want to ask people's questions, but they have to ask me <laughs> for me to be able to answer it. So, 
Okay, Declan, I think you have got a problem with your mic. That's um, my technical assistance here saying, and it's it's not you're not being allowed to be unmuted for some reason. And thank you, Jackie, for that. Thank you, Kathy. Yeah. I think, yeah, I won't make you all sing. <laughs> Unless anybody wants to. No, I won't do that. No. If there's any more, have local churches commissioned artists much in recent years? There's a question. No. <laughs> Is the answer. Um, there are some nice contemporary, um, Skenos has got nice, lots of nice contemporary art in it. There's a new Methodist community church down the Newton Arge Road. But no, there's, um, no, they haven't done. They, they, yeah, they're interested in what, you have a lot of the connections with a lot of the ministers and the clergy and stuff, whatever now. So they're really, they're interested. But like the media, I don't fit in anybody's box. I'm kind of out of the box. Box doesn't exist for me. So it's hard to kind of do that. Okay. You spoke about bringing your book to England. Yeah, Hayley. Yes, I had. I had a really strange idea. Well, it's not strange. I had the idea because I went to, uh, I lived in England for a long time. I went to college in the south of England in the 80s. Um, I really, I know that I know that people in Belfast aren't the only ones who need a different perspective of Northern Ireland. We're a little bit confusing. And uh, I had this bizarre idea of, of actually going on a tour of all of the cities that had been blown up by the IRA um, in order to, and doing a presentation on like this contemporary existence. That was kind of in, in my mind. I did um, get I did get invited to Liverpool in order to do something, but it's like the lockdown just happened and it just put an end to any invitations to do anything anywhere. Um, but yes, I'm very well aware that you know England England requires a different it's we're Northern Ireland, North of Ireland, whatever you want to call us, we are, we are kind of a weird schizophrenic place, and and new perspectives need to be kind of seen or presented to many people in Ireland and in Scotland, Wales, and in England. So yeah, I'm open to that, and I think uh, interestingly, when I did. When I did a, a note, uh, when I did a talk in Dublin, I had an exhibition in Dublin before, and I did a talk. Um, there were a couple of people who came. I don't know if Vicky is still on here, but somebody came, and what they, they just they came, and what they did was they just started they just started talking about the troubles, and they just started talking about something that had happened to them and their family. And they just, once they started, they just they just couldn't stop talking about it. And I think it's part of the trauma that we have. That's part of our trauma. And that's part of the trauma that people hold, that we need a, in order to try and transmute it onto into something else, we need to, you know, think there's different things that can kind of help and facilitate that. And I think this is, is one of them. Um, and I know I've been at things before. Um, I worked, did some work with Grindworks over in England. We were doing training. And as soon as people heard my accent, it was like um, I got all the ex-soldiers who were in there 
who just started like going, you're from Northern Ireland and who, who would just like sit and talk to you, just needed to talk to you and say, look, I was 16 and I was sent over there. And, you know, so there's a massive, there's a massive, massive, um, there's a massive kind of need for it. So my, my bizarre idea was I would go to all the places that had been blown up as a starting point. Um, but who knows? Who knows what's going to happen and what's going to go on? Um, okay. Tommy, I could talk for Ireland on this, so I think you better, you better put the outro videos on in order to see. It's so lovely to see everybody. I want you all to... I want Nobert and I to feed you all somewhere, sometime on that. I want you all to, to, yeah, to really stay well and to, um, yeah, and to, to have a wee think. And if, if there's anything you think of that you think I should be doing, oh, Nobert has offered pasta for everybody. <laughs> That would be good. A few bottles of wine. If anybody's not sure, no bear, he's there up on your screen. That's my husband. <laughs> so he's offering um, pasta for everybody. A few bottles of wine, I'd say, would go in there as well. Um, no, that would be lovely. Tommy, it's over to you.